Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Lahav Harkov. I'm a diplomatic correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. Uh, and I'm here to moderate our panel on the geopolitical dimension of uh, the, the ICC issue uh, as it pertains to Israel. Um, on this panel is uh, former Knesset member Michal Cutler Wunsch, who was the Knesset's uh, former liaison on matters related to the ICC, a uh, member of the European Parliament, Soren Jade. Um, and he is the former defense minister of Denmark and uh, retired Brigadier General Michael Herzog from the Forum of Strategic Dialogue. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear people's thoughts about the, the impact of this issue, the ICC, on Israel-Palestinian relations and the prospects of a peace process. I think, um, you know, in the, in the short term or sort of immediately after the investigation was announced, we saw the, the Shin Bet, the Israel Security Services, um, take away the VIP pass of the Palestinian Foreign Minister Maliki. Um, and we Israeli officials have said that similar moves are expected to come. But how do you expect this to impact uh, the prospects of peace sort of in the longer term than in just the next few weeks? Um, um, who would like to go first? Okay, um, I'll ask uh, Michael Herzog if you could uh, answer the question first. Uh, maybe Michal Kotler want to start and I'll follow. Sure, ladies first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, first of all, thank you um, for the organizers. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this very, very important panel and uh, follow in the aftermath of the legal component of the discussion, which is so very important as, a, as the um, ground setting for the continued discussion. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't, of course, merci to Ambassador Zimere and, and actually just reiterate um, Tal Becker's sort of understanding. The commitment to this cause and court um, of the state of Israel is undeniable um, in terms of um, Israel's history. Um, and however, um, the one thing that I wanted to sort of um, interject and maybe add, and luckily I don't have to be in the legal panel or the, you know, sort of um, refer to all of the issues that um, both uh, Professor Erwin Kotler and Eliakim Rubenstein referred to in their opening address with regards to jurisdiction and complementarity. But I would say um, that the foundational principles of the court um, as a court of last resort, which Tal referred to really to conduct investigations of the most heinous crimes, um, those foundational principles cannot actually be overlooked or undermined without having ramifications to our question, to our panel. Um, not just to the trust of countries to join as members or non-members um, to the Rome Statute, but actually to the understanding of what this court of last resort is meant to serve as a court of law. Um, and so, yes, the fact that we are now moving from the, former, the, the previous panel to this panel that talks about the political ramifications, and in fact, the use um, that the Palestinian Authority declared that it was making of a court of law for political purposes um, in order to maybe push ahead what was unsuccessful in terms of um, discussions between Israel and the Palestinians, I very much agree with Tal's um, sort of assertion that this undermines the capacity to speak to each other. It undermines um, the dialogue that's necessary, and it undermines actually the possibility for any um, sustainable, long-lasting peace between countries, because as we know, actually, the Oslo Accords, which are, you know, at the moment, the only legal framework um, governing um, um, the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians, have prerequisites to them, Israeli security and peaceful coexistence and education for peace and development of effective Palestinian governance. And ignoring all of those and enabling this kind of submission or allegation of war crimes against the state of Israel to be made, as I said, utilizing such an important institution, um, um, that is the ICC, um, is actually I would argue undermines the agency of, of the Palestinian people, the Palestinian um, leadership to take responsibility um, as the guiding framework, the guiding legal framework of, of the Oslo Accord is so deeply undermined by this move um, that was made. And, 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 and so when we look forward and not just back, um, the prospects of, of, of dialogue, of real um, uh, opportunity for long lasting peace um, between 
between the parties is undermined along with you know, that original um, step forward to utilize a court of law for such political um, purposes. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, I, at this point, you know, and the previous panel spoke a lot about the reform recommendations, I would argue that actually, um, and I believe it was Ambassador um, Demaray that spoke about how should we look at, uh, at, at the decision of the ICC as friend of Israel. And my question is actually, how should we look at the ICC as friends of the ICC, both as member states of the ICC and the Rome Statute or funding states of the ICC and as trustees of international law around the world, all you know, with shared responsibility to ensure that it fulfills its original mandate. So maybe I'll end there for now and um, hear from Mike and then we can continue. Um, so, um, Mike, did you want to say something? Were you okay? No, I suggest you move to uh, MEP Gadi and then yes. I'll speak. Uh, I, I also understand that he's uh, limited in time, so let's move to him. Okay, great. So, uh, MEP uh, Gadi, sorry for mispronouncing your name earlier. Um, I, I'd like to ask you. Um, do you think that uh, it's legitimate that the Palestinians are using a, a legal forum of the ICC to answer the political question of, of their statehood? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for giving me time to, to speak here today. I think this is a very important issue. I have, you know, it has been on my agenda in my former life when I was a Minister of Defense. And if we remember, you know, the International Crime Court, the ICC, was established in the wake of the lessons from World War II to address horrific, uh, horrifying crimes and to serve as a legal tool and not to be a political tool. I mean, this should not be a weapon people use against each other in an ongoing political conflict, like the case in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where one party, uh, and allow me to say it, the Palestinian Authority, is trying to use the court against the other. And in this, this means here Israel. Now, this is a source of concern for the West as a whole, as I see it, not just for Israel, because the ICC has already been uh, politicized uh, in the past, used against the uh, United States, United Kingdom. Jurisdiction was a big uh, challenge in the pre-trial. By establishing jurisdiction, the court went into the political debate whether or not there is a Palestinian state. Now, it prejudged a political question which should be addressed predominantly with political rather than legal tools. And this forces the parties to adopt rigid positions on this uh, very important issue. Now, the ICC invest investigations was, uh, will cast a shadow over the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and over the US and, and Europe to play roles of mediators. It could, as I see it, jeopardize chances for resolution on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. At a time, there are chances of a rapid is Israel normalization. This runs against the current. Now, the EU should take a more proactive position favoring Arab Israeli normalization. Now, the 2014 war between Israel and Hamas and the 2018 Great March of Return protesters was investigated by Hamas and you know it more than I do, but those, those are political rivals of the Palestinian authorities and the Palestinian authorities filed um, against Israel for defending itself uh, against uh, Hamas uh, rockets. And I've been there and I've seen and uh, been in Israel when they are rocked and it's, it's terrifying. The impl implications for the West, well, as I see it, any enemy forces, Islamic or others, can use and abuse the court to attack the West. There are European forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere fighting against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, French forces in Africa. In Iraq, the court already started an investigation against the United Kingdom a few years ago. Quite recently, the court closes the file because it accepted the UK argument of uh, com complementary. The EU should take a stronger position on this issue because it could impact negatively on Europe as well. Now the international community should have a hard look at what should be the focus of the court. The question of reforming the court and making sure it's not used for political purposes 
is, as I see it, very important. Many countries, including Germany and Austria, and respected legal authorities oppose the ICC investigation based on substantial legal arguments and accepted principles of international law, while the EU, France and United Kingdom took a more cautious line. We all remember the Trump administration, they applied sanctions against senior members of the ICC. President Biden, he removed the sanction and he stated, but he stated that the ICC does not have a jurisdiction on the matters uh, pertaining to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If anybody wants to advance the cause of peace, it should uh, speak out against using legal tools because it will undermine those efforts. The EU is a strong supporter of a two-state solution. The window should be kept open for future negotiations and Europe should oppose any counterproductive steps. I'm concerned about the upcoming Palestinian elections as Hamas, designated by the European Union as a terrorist organization, could be incorporated into a future Palestinian power sharing arrangement. Democracy must be protected by all means from those that would abuse legal processes to advance radical, illiberal and anti-democratic agendas. And I think I will leave it here. I think I've used my five minutes, but thank you once again to let me speak on this issue. And I know that uh, this has a great impact on families, on governments, on peace process, but also on those boots on the ground that defend uh, our way of life in the uh, harsh uh, arrangements around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and bring your General Herzog. Um, I guess I'd like to hear from you a bit about the cooperation between Israel and the Palestinians, which has been going on uh, for decades at this point and is important to the security um, of the West Bank and of Israelis and Palestinians and sort of where you think uh, that'll be going in the near future in light of this ICC investigation. Well, thank you very much, Lahav. Uh, this uh, roundtable raises a question of uh, the relations between uh, political tools and legal tools in a, in a defined conflict like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Historically, the Palestinians, uh, until the last decade, hardly resorted to uh, legal means, uh, not only because we had, uh, we had negotiations, but for other reasons as well. I think they initially understood that uh, legalizing the conflict uh, is, is problematic. Uh, with one exception, to, uh, in the early 2000s, when uh, Israel uh, moved to uh, construct the separation uh, fence between Israel and the West Bank in order to stop Palestinian suicide bombers uh, in Israeli cities, they went to the International Court of Justice through others. But uh, other than that, they hardly resorted to legal means. This change over the last decade and uh, culminating in, uh, uh, in this investigation, a decision to investigate by the ICC. This was initiated by the Palestinians. It was fueled by the Palestinians. And I think uh, one of the main reasons why they went there is because other Palestinian strategies failed. They uh, negotiated with Israel and negotiations did not yield the uh, desired results on their part. They went to uh, what they call armed struggle, suicide bombing, rockets, uh, and, and violent means, and they failed. They failed in what they call uh, popular resistance. And uh, one of the reasons they failed because they didn't go all the way because they were afraid it would turn against them. So they resorted to a political legal campaign against the state of Israel, which includes, on the one hand, uh, uh, getting recognition, international recognition as a state and using this uh, position as a state in order uh, to attack Israel legally, especially in the International uh, Criminal Court. This uh, phase of taking Israel to the ICC, I think, uh, exacerbate relations between Israelis and Palestinians it will cast a, a very big shadow over our relations uh, uh, over the long term. 
uh, for several reasons. I mean, Israel, uh, the way Israel responded in the, in the past to the ICJ or to uh, Palestinians going to the UN was relatively mild, but I think this is going to change. For one thing, it's going to change because uh, this investigation threatens to take Israeli officials to court. Israeli senior officials and, uh, and IDF uh, officers and so on. And I think there's little tolerance in Israel uh, for that. Second, the context. Uh, two of the cases are about uh, events in Gaza. Uh, the, uh, the war in Gaza in 2014, where Israel uh, went into Gaza after uh, thousands of rockets were fired at it. And uh, there's feeling in Israel that while well, we Israelis uh, went to fight a war of self-defense, now uh, uh, we are taken to court uh, for that. And, uh, and by whom? By, by the Palestinian Authority, who is the political enemy of Hamas. So uh, I can tell you from my own experience, in, uh, uh, when we fought the first round with Hamas in 2008-9, after they took over Gaza violently in 2007, I was at a meeting with the very senior leadership of the PA, and we said to them, uh, we may have to go into Gaza, let us hand it over to you. You take over Gaza, okay? And they said to us, uh, we can't go in on Israeli bayonets, but you go in and destroy Hamas. So we went in, we hit Hamas, and then they said, you are war criminals. So this really, I mean, drives Israelis uh, crazy. I would also mention that there is a psychological element here, namely, as was mentioned in the, in the previous uh, panel, this court was established uh, in the wake of lessons learned from World War II, where a third of the Jewish people was exterminated. And now the Palestinians, who are in a political conflict with that, bestow a jurisdiction uh, to the court in order to investigate the Jewish state. I, there's a psychological element, and I think uh, talking about Israeli mentality as ambassadors in race, though, you have to understand why Israelis respond in such a harsh uh, manner. And I would say that uh, if this issue is not taken off the table, it will cast a very big shadow over Israeli-Palestinian relations uh, over the, uh, you know, the long term. So you already see the first signs. Uh, you mentioned, love that uh, when the Palestinian Foreign Minister Riyad Malki returned from The Hague, where he went to the prosecutor to fuel the investigation, Israel denied him the VIP uh, card. And Israelis are saying uh, they are threatening Israelis abroad. They, why should they enjoy, you know, uh, free movement anywhere with the court? Uh, it was reported, and when the head of the Israeli uh, internal security services went to see Abu Mazen recently, one of the main points he raised was uh, this. So I would say whoever uh, cares about future israeli palestinian relations, keeping a window open for future negotiations, mediation, and so on, should consider that as long as this investigation exists and goes on and moves on, uh, it will make it extremely difficult to uh, uh, proceed with the uh, israeli palestinian negotiations and the process. It is very difficult for me to see any Israeli government, right, center-right or center-left, uh, just going like this to negotiations and, uh, and compromise as long as there is a Palestinian fueled investigation against them and the threat of arresting uh, Israelis. So when the United States and Europe think about a future process and mediation, they should be aware of this. And any future initiative, political initiative between Israelis and Palestinians will be unable to ignore this. It will have to be addressed as, uh, as this is law. It was mentioned here in the previous session, the issue of uh, recognizing uh, Palestinian uh, status. So let me address it not from the legal point of view, but from the geopolitical point of view. And I can tell you that uh, when the Palestinians started their quest for international recognition as a state and went to the UN, there was a debate in the Israeli system. There were people who said, 
why do we care? Okay, let them uh, be recognized by the international community as a state. And then when we sit down to negotiate, we negotiate uh, uh, state to state. It may be easier for us, who cares? But uh, the main reason uh, Israeli governments throughout uh, the years uh, rejected that uh, was not only because of the discrepancy between the uh, formal status of a commission as a state and the situation on the ground, but mainly because Israelis understood that once the Palestinians get recognized as a state, they will use it as a uh, as a legal weapon against Israel, which is exactly what happened in uh, the ICC. So I would say I contend that uh, um, if uh, this issue will be taken off the table by the new prosecutor or because they will uh, accept Israeli uh, arguments about complementarity or for any other reason, okay, uh, the, the train already left the station. But if it is not, it will be a, a big issue, uh, casting a big shadow over Israeli-Palestinian relations. And I think that whoever cares about a uh, future, the prospects of future relations, negotiations, so on, and I say it as someone who devoted over two decades of his life to Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, should be aware Thank you. that this... Sorry. It's yes. not going to contribute to Israeli-Palestinian peace. Thank you very much. Um, MEP uh, Gada, I know that you, um, you need to get going, so I'll ask you my next question, which is, uh, what do you think Europe's role should be in all of this? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's strange for me because every time this is on the table, the conflict in Israeli and Palestinian conflict, there's so many um, emotions into it. You can see it also when we debated in the, in the European Parliament. And I think we should also look upon it in a practical way. And, and I really, what I've said, I mean it. Uh, if we do care about the conflict and we do care about, you know, uh, we advanced towards a more peaceful uh, 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 situation in the Middle East, I think we have to look into this because this is a huge stone on this path if we want to you know negotiate and if Europe really wants to be part of it and have those strong views on the on the two-state solution so so I think we will be will not be part of the of the game if we if we do not change this and if we do not accept that the ICC should not be used as a political tool it is too easy this is a, a, a political a question and a political problem. This is not something you just put on a judge and you you think you can get them uh, uh, solve everything. So 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 I think we have to Europe has to re rethink it. But I know that it's difficult because there's so all those emotions at stake. Uh, and of course uh, we have to also to look into U.S. You know uh, Biden has uh, made his move on this, but he has also said that uh, the ICC does not have jurisdiction on the, this matter. And I, and I do hope that uh, he will win and convince Europe that this is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's continue and speak about the US. Um, so the US on the one hand says that the, uh, that the ICC does not have jurisdiction to investigate Israel. And on the other hand has removed sanctions um, and the Palestinians in the meantime say that after talking to officials in the Biden administration, they're optimistic about uh, the prospects for peace talks. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, former Kessel member Cutler Wunsch, uh, what, what is your assessment of the U.S. stance on, on the ICC issue? So I just want to just follow up on what um, uh, member of parliament Daddy said just about, um, about, about Europe as well. So I, I think, and, and we would be remiss if we didn't mention that seven countries submitted amicus briefs to the ICC um, with regards to, you know, jurisdiction um, not being there. Um, and, um, and, and therefore we can't just ignore those. And I think we um, have to actually follow up and those countries actually have the responsibility to follow up because the moment that countries submit those briefs as friends of the court, as funding um, members of the court and are actually ignored by the court, that has implications as well. So, uh, and just to just piggyback um, off, off what was said, I think that Europe has 
an extremely important role to play in, in understanding the importance that the ICC actually fulfill its original mandate as a court of last resort for the most heinous atrocities and crimes and not, and not to be utilized or, or weaponized um, in this way because, you know, um, uh, uh, um, it was said that there are a lot of emotions involved, but actually, you know, having clerked in the Supreme Court and knowing, you know, the justice that I clerked for has those three monkeys, you know, hear no evil, see no evil. Um, there should be, when it comes to the law, no emotion involved. And utilizing the law in this way, weaponizing international law in this way, undermines the possibility of international law for all. Now that brings us to the question regarding the United States. And I would probably utilize the same sort of logic that says the following. If the United States is, in fact, to take back its, its, you know, or to take a role, a significant role, a leadership role um, in advancing whether it's peace between Israel and the Palestinians or advancing um, the role of international law and its institutions and the commitment to human rights, um, then the United States actually has um, a, a very important role to play in this regard as well. And as we know, you know, the ICC's relationship with the United States is such that it's made the decisions it's made regarding the United States. And I, you know, and I would argue once again, this is not about the ICC's decision with regards to Israel. This is about the ICC's decision with regards to the ICC, um, just, you know, within the same year um, uh, that the reform recommendations, hundreds of them actually were submitted, this being but one case and cause um, that actually speaks to the transparency or lack thereof um, that, um, that the um, external panel um, of experts submitted with regards to the reform of the ICC for it to fulfill its intended mandate. And again, um, the United States role in ensuring that that mandate is fulfilled by the ICC as such an important court of last resort, a court of law mandated to uphold, promote, and protect international law and human rights. I would hope um, that that is the role that the United States decides to take with regards not just to the decision vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but with regards to the ICC in general. Thank you. Um, Brigadier General Herzog, do you have something uh, you want to add about the United States? Uh, I'll just say that uh, to me, uh, the question of whether or not the U.S. applies sanctions against uh, senior personalities in the ICC is less important than the question of uh, how is the United States going to deal with this question. This is a hot potato, as I try to explain. So uh, it's one thing to say we uh, don't believe that the court has jurisdiction. It's something else to uh, take a proactive stand and work with European allies to try and take this issue off the table. That is more important. So I, I'm still waiting to see uh, what this administration is going to do about it beyond rhetoric. So I, I think there's a very interesting contrast here. I'm at the Jerusalem Post, and we had a report over the weekend of uh, a Fatah official, I believe it was, um, you know, saying that he he's optimistic that there's going to be negotiations and peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians following his conversations with Biden administration officials. Um, and as someone who reports on the Israeli officials, I found that very strange because all you hear from Israelis these days is the opposite. Everyone is, is very angry sort of and saying that, you know, if the Palestinians are going to set all these obstacles in front of us and, and try to put us in front of an international tribunal, why should we work with them? Um, do you think that, that where do you think that that's going to go, you know, in terms of uh, international pressure and, and a sort of a renewed will from the U.S. to try to push negotiations under the shadow of this ICC case? I would say first, uh, we all realize that uh, the Middle East is a low priority for the Biden administration, perhaps with, except of, uh, with the exception of Iran. And, uh, and uh, part of this is uh, a low priority for the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, nobody in the new administration is talking about resuming negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. They are focused on re-engaging the Palestinians, providing assistance, uh, kind of uh, uh, stabilizing the situation, de-escalating, keeping the window open, but negotiations are 
not uh, on the screen uh, right now, but maybe in the future they will be. And uh, whoever thinks about it has to, I, I think from now on, the issue of the ICC will follow us. And no matter what, and whoever thinks about uh, the future will have to think about it as well. Um, I, was, I was just going to add, actually, um, in the context of this last year and the Abraham Accords and in the way that they chart the path forward for perspective, peace between peoples in the region, including with the Palestinians. So if we think of the you know, paradigm shift inherent to the Abraham Accords from, you know, the three no's of the Khartoum 1967 co conference to the three yeses, yes to recognition, yes to negotiation, yes to peace in that order. Then I think the question of the ICC and also the way that, you know, the Palestinians um, can be stripped of agency if we don't expect them as an equal partner with equal rights and equal responsibilities to acknowledge the right to exist of each other, right, the mutual right to exist, um, then it would really be a, a step back away from the potential paradigm shift that we see in the region. I believe that it affects Israelis, including Israeli Arabs and Jews internally. Potentially, it can affect Israel-Palestinian relations and, of course, with other peoples in the region. Um, and it would really be um, a, a missed opportunity if the United States were not to utilize um, this situation in order to actually expect the Palestinians to have the same kind of agency as every other people is expected to have. So to be able to hold the stick at both ends, to be able to utilize or benefit from principles and institutions of international law, while at the very same time violating um, and, and, and stepping all over international law and not be held to account by those international institutions. And maybe we can talk about some of them, even in the context of this last decision, which you know very ironically begins its mandate from the day after three Israeli teens were abducted and murdered. Um, if it does not hold the Palestinians to account in the same way, then it actually preserves this notion of victimhood, strips the Palestinians of agency and takes, as I think Mike um, said before as well, um, really takes a real um, uh, uh, or presents a real setback to the potential of, of future negotiations. And it would really be a missed opportunity for the United States if it were to decide that it's leaning in and taking an active role, in fact. Um, and even if it doesn't, um, by, by empowering um, that sort of um, old narrative of rejectionism versus normalization that we've seen over the last year, it would, by definition, set back the prospect of peace between the Palestinians and Israel. Uh, Ambassador Dennis Ross uh, wants to chime in. Um, if you could uh, unmute yourself, we'd, be, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, look, let me just lend my voice to what Michal and Mike just said. Uh, but I want to offer a specific response to the question you posed, uh, which was really, where is the U.S. coming from on the peace issue? And Mike, I think, put it very well. For the Biden administration, this is not in the top tier of concerns. But to be fair, it reflects a kind of reading of the prospects of peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. It doesn't reflect a desire to see peace emerge, but it does reflect an understanding that there is no big new opportunity that's available to produce peace between the Israelis and Palestinians based on bilateral negotiations. Bilateral negotiations will always be the preferred tool, but there's an understanding that the gap between Israelis and Palestinians, both substantively and psychologically is so great that the idea that you're gonna throw yourselves into launching a big initiative on this issue just isn't there. You were posing the question, why are the Palestinians sort of saying they're optimistic now? I would say this is a kind of classic example of wanting to frame the issue a certain way, wanting to create a certain reality that actually doesn't exist, wanting to create a sense of some success politically uh, at a time when the PA doesn't have a lot of signs of success. So it's, a, it's an exercise in trying to say, look, the world is different after Trump for us, it'll be much better. But it's not based on the idea that the US is gonna somehow come in and immediately identify with everything that we want uh, it doesn't reflect that reality. It does reflect, I think, a kind of desire to present a political reality the way they would like to frame that political reality, not necessarily where the Biden administration is coming from. This whole discussion as it relates to the ICC, I think, is, I think it's an important discussion to have because I don't know that the administration has fully internalized 
what are the real implications of this for the future of Israeli Israeli Palestinian peace? Uh, and to be fair, part of that is that this administration has been in power now, I think, 77 days. It does not have a deputy secretary of state confirmed. It does not have an undersecretary of state confirmed. It has no assistant secretaries of state confirmed. So many of the people who would assume responsibility for dealing with this issue are actually not in place. And the people who are at the highest rungs of the administration, not only are, at least in foreign policy, are focused on China, uh, reestablishing uh, the US as a, as a good global citizen, uh, emphasizing the priority of climate change, uh, focused on how you deal with the Russians and what they seem to be doing on the border with Ukraine. There are all these other demands, plus the one issue in the Middle East that has captured the administration's attention is Iran. So all these other issues are quite prominent. The idea of how to think about the implications of the ICC as it might relate to Israeli-Palestinian peace is something that just at this point, I don't think has been internalized, at least at the highest levels of the administration. Uh, that will come uh, because as people get more people get appointed, uh, even with this not being uh, one of the highest priorities, there will be increasing discussion of this. And obviously, there will be more of a chance for the Israelis to have their own discussions with the administration. Uh, I, I think I could be accused of understatement if I were to say that at this point, the, uh, the political realities in Israel haven't lent themselves to what I might say is the kind of strategic discussion that needs to take place between the Biden administration and the Israeli government. But that too will come at some point. Thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna start taking questions uh, from the audience. Um, I've been submitted a question without a name, sorry. Um, what should the seven member states that made su submissions do now that the court apparently disagrees with these members about the statehood of Palestine? Um, and uh, since we are our uh, European participant left, um, if there are other members of the European Parliament in the audience, which I, I'm aware that there are, um, but if anyone would also like to chime in, uh, I would be interested to hear what you think um, the European countries that filed amicus briefs uh, could do now that their position has apparently been rejected by the court. Uh, but we'll start with uh, either uh, Michal or Michael, whichever of you wants to answer first. So maybe I'll just I'll just say on that briefly. Um, it, it's not just seven countries, and actually Canada that submitted a letter, but in, but actually a lot of other um, uh, very significant international law experts, um, including Ambassador Dennis Ross. Um, who submitted very important um, legal stances to the ICC. And when you think about sort of, you know, again, I go back to the first panel about undermining of international law principles and the implications for the world over, for trustees of international law and human rights, for all those that are state parties to the Rome Statute, funding members of the ICC. Um, and when you take it um, in conjunction with, as I spoke about, the hundreds of reform recommendations that if we sort of delve into, which we won't because we don't have so long, I would say transparency is a huge one. And the process um, that, you know, that the prosecutor made this decision with regards to Israel actually suffers from a great deal of lack of transparency. So when you think of the, the, the um, responsibility that comes um, to all those states, countries, state parties, funders of the ICC, those that submitted amicus briefs, certainly. Um, I think that there is a, a real um, potential for, um, for that reform, for that much needed reform as the ICC itself was um, sort of proposed um, that is necessary. And, and I think that that is the role, um, not, not just of the seven countries that submitted the amicus briefs, but as I said, all those that submitted those briefs and also um, international um, uh, or trustees of international law and human rights around the globe that are committed to the ICC itself, um, as uh, if we go back to the beginning of the first panel, as friends of the ICC, and not just, or not at all, as friends of Israel. Um, that would be my sort of reply to that. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any uh, European audience members who wanted to chime in? parliamentarians. All right. Well, um, we actually don't have any other audience questions, um, but we do have some more time. 
Um, so, you know, I think um, as someone who reports on this issue and gets a lot of questions from people uh, around Israel about it, I, I, I would be interested to hear what you think the the implications are for Israel. Why should Israelis, why does the average Israeli need to care about this and how's it going to affect them? That's the, that's a question I hear a lot and I think it would be interesting to hear your takes on it. So, so maybe I'll, 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 I'll chime in first of all as a former um, MK that was really the first time liaison on, 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 on all matters related to the ICC in Knesset and say why it's important as a member of Knesset um, for us to take an active role. And actually Ambassador Demsros um, referred to, you know, sort of the lack of stability um, internally or political stability in Israel. But I, I'd say that there are untapped resources, even, you know, where there is a little bit of stability, um, i.e. the Knesset. So there are a lot of formal and informal opportunities to engage with parliamentarians around the world on this issue and actually have a discussion very much like the one that we're having in, you know, very informal settings or more formal ones. So the interparliamentary group that Israel is a um, state is a member of or the friendship groups that Israel is a member of. And the, the interesting thing about those engagements and the importance of having continuity um, within Knesset, and I hope that this role will continue, um, apart from, you know, the role of an MP as legislator and as supervising the executive branch actually was to have these um, official and unofficial engagements with parliamentarians around the world that can hold their own governments to account, that can ask questions of their governments. That is a really important piece. Um, and I know you didn't ask about that. And with regards to your question, Lahav, um, I think it affects every single citizen of the state of Israel. Um, and the implications of this potentially um, affects every one of us uh, and will be of real or should be of real interest to all citizens of the state of Israel. And what I would hope is that it actually encourages us to not only reaffirm international law and respect it as the state of Israel does, but to actually utilize um, uh, international law and uh, utilize the language of rights, the lingua franca spoken by both our friends and our foes. Um, in order to enable the state of Israel, not only in this regard, but in many others, to rise from the docket of the accused um, and to be able to engage in, in, in the language that our friends and our foes not only utilize and understand, and I don't mean English, I mean literally the language of international law and human rights, um, in order to connect the dots so that we can enable, we can facilitate um, much of perhaps what was the earlier panel that was discussed, what, why is Israel's you know, state of mind such that it doesn't have that trust? Um, enable that, enable that understanding, but also be able to be um, a force for the advancement of our shared collective responsibility to protect our shared collective responsibility to international law and its standards, and certainly to the mandate, original mandate of the ICC as the court of last resort that can investigate the most heinous of crimes, be they genocide, be they crimes against humanity, and as we speak, um, intended to uphold our shared promise and commitment to never again in a world of again and again when we look around us. And that shared responsibility is one that I hope very much that not only the citizens of the state of Israel, but the government and all parliamentarians will take an active role in. Uh, if I may answer your questions. So uh, first on your question, why should Israelis care? Israelis care about it very much because it touches on each and every, almost each and every family in Israel, okay? Uh, our uh, sons serve in the army. They are asked by the state to go and, and fight to protect the country. And uh, the prospects of them uh, being sent to fight and then taken to court for alleged war crimes is something that uh, nobody is willing to, uh, to sustain. I think it's not just a general political question or theoretical question. It touches potentially on every family in Israel. And the interesting thing is that while in Israel this is a very big thing and, you know, it, most, uh, people are really care about it, uh, elsewhere you see indifference. It's uh, very remote. I mean, uh, as Dennis mentioned, in the U.S. Uh, there's no real discussion about this in the government. Certainly public opinion is unaware, I think. In the Palestinian street, they hardly talk about it. I mean, the Palestinian body politic, you know, leaders and so on, Yes, they, it's important for them uh, in uh, confronting Israel, but in public opinion, and I follow the Palestinian uh, media, 
nobody really talks about it. When will they start talking about it? When uh, it becomes a more a hot issue between Israelis and Palestinians and uh, might implicate have implications on their daily lives. But I would I'd like to say a word about your previous question about uh, what Europeans can do, can do about this. So uh, I here I want to tie the legal and the geopolitical dimensions. Actually, the court said that the issue of jurisdiction could be challenged in, at any future phase. And the court has yet to uh, discuss the issues of complementarity and gravity. And uh, uh, I think that there is going to be a new prosecutor. So the, this so-called battle is not over. It could be uh, ongoing. And, uh, and I think also the argument about the potential negative uh, implications for Israeli-Palestinian relations in future negotiations should also be considered in the legal domain. And uh, here I would like to see Europeans take more of a proactive uh, role in, this, in the discussion of each and every one of these issues in the future. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, William Halimi from the CRIF, which is the uh, umbrella organization of uh, Jewish organizations in France. Um, his question is, um, you know, we've been discussing how the ICC issue will impact relations between Israel and the Palestinians, uh, but will they have any impact on uh, the Abraham Accords or on any sort of future normalizations? I don't think so. I don't think so because uh, I think there are the deep reasons for uh, normalization have to do with uh, deep, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, geostrategic challenges in the Middle East like Iran, Turkey and so on. The perception that the U.S. is retreating and all of these elements drive Arabs closer to Israel. On, uh, and uh, this is coupled by a very deep uh, socio-economic crisis in the Middle East, and we've seen the so-called Arab Spring and uh, the devastation brought about the Middle East. So I think uh, these are very strong motivations, and I don't think that uh, the fact that there is an international investigation against Israel uh, will really uh, make a difference What with the fact that uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue is not as high on the Arab agenda as it used to be. It still resonates, it's still there, but it's not top priority for the Arabs. So uh, for all of these reasons, I don't believe that uh, this will make a big difference. So maybe I would just add that if we see the Abraham Accords as limited to the countries they've already been sort of signed with, Bahrain, UAE, Morocco, Sudan, then, you know, then I, I agree with Mike. I, I, I don't think that they would affect or set back um, those agreements. But if we see them as something that actually paves the path forward uh, for a continued uh, possibility um, of additional countries or peoples that would join the concept um, and the paradigm shift that is inherent to the, to the Abraham Accords, I think that it could have a negative effect. Um, in fact, and certainly if we look very, very closely at the potential that it would have with regards to Israel-Palestinian um, uh, sort of forward-looking processes that we uh, would hope uh, with, you know, between Israel and Palestinian people, and I'm not necessarily talking about the current leadership of the Palestinians, but in the future, um, I, I, would, I would see this as actually as a step back um, in terms of the um, accountability the Palestinians are held to um, um, and the possibility of sort of ret retrieving or, um, or, or, or retracting back into the state of rejectionism um, that was enabled for so many years by the previous paradigm um, that actually stripped them of agency of the possibility of moving forward um, in what the Abraham Accords actually hold as a potential paradigm shift. So we have another uh, question from someone named uh, Stella Velici, Velici uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, um, and she asked um, about the, the Palestinians' own policies and actions uh, and whether they'll be taken into consideration by the ICC. For example, um, their, their so-called pay-for-slay policy where they provide monthly stipends for Palestinian terrorists and their families. Um, is, is that something that will come up in this case? Uh, 
uh, the case is about uh, three files. One is uh, the 2014 war in Gaza. The other is the so-called Palestinian march of return on the borders between Gaza and Israel. And the third is settlement. So the court is not going to investigate uh, anything else. Uh, if the court decides to investigate, it will investigate not only Israel, but also Hamas. But uh, it will not deal with any of the other questions, including the one referred to in the question. All right, well, our time is coming to a close. Um, if there are any closing statements you'd like to make or any issues um, around this that we haven't addressed yet, uh, feel free. Well, maybe I would just reiterate and go back to the keynote presentations um, of Professor Erwin Kotler of uh, former Justice um, Elikim Rubenstein and take it back to, because we can't ignore um, the legal um, implications of undermining foundational principles upon which the ICC was founded. And so we've moved sort of naturally into, you know, the, 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 the fact of the weaponization of the law in order to advance political um, goals. Um, and I think that we would be remiss if we enabled that sort of transition to go unnoted because the very foundational principles of the law and the fact that they are undermined in this way should really trouble us all. It should not be something that the state of Israel is um, alone um, in is sort of addressing or in exposing um, in terms of the un undermining of those foundational principles. They are the very premise upon which the ICC sits in order to fulfill um, its original mandate, um, which is as important now as it was when the ICC was founded. Um, and so I, I would go back to those keynote addresses that were so, so important in terms of addressing the issues of jurisdiction, of complementarity, Todd Becker's presentation, those that we've heard in terms of the law and, and not um, ignore them when we sort of evaluate um, the tremendous um, importance of engaging on this issue um, with, as I said, um, all countries around the world, all those that submitted amicus briefs, all those that regard themselves as trustees of international law and human rights, certainly member states of the Rome Statute and funding um, members of the ICC itself. It is a tremendously important moment in terms of the ICC's potential to fulfill its mandate so needed in a world um, of heinous atrocities um, that, are, that are unaddressed actually as we speak. Um, so yeah, very important. Uh, I would say that uh, in geopolitical terms, uh, this is uh, a landmine that was placed by the Palestinians for Israel to step on. Uh, it's time the international community realizes that uh, both parties are going to step on it and it's going to undermine our relations for a long time.